We're live. This is the human condition. I'm Vince Orlando. I'm Sean Davis. I'm Steve. Did I throw everybody else off the, the, the new seating arrangements? Yeah, I didn't know which order we were going. Uh, you know, amazing. Throw a monkey wrench in the program. And it, uh, this is a good time to throw a monkey wrench in the program, too, because we're talking about habits. Habits today. <clears throat> the power of habit. You know, I actually, when I was putting that little snippet together, that little blurb, I didn't even realize that a book that I'm I'm reading right now. I, I haven't even got a chapter into it. Somebody gave it to me as a gift. It's actually called The Power of Habit. It's a, so far, it's a really good book. It's a great book. But I, I've been, I've known for a long time the power of habit in, in either direction, either positive or negative. Addiction is a habit. At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's a, it's a compulsory go-to mechanism that, uh, that can lead you down the wrong path typically does lead you down the wrong path. Hopefully, in the end, it exposes you to a, a, a greater path. But but it's a compulsive behavior that becomes second nature after it's practiced for long enough. On the flip side, habit can be extremely powerful and beneficial for you to, and for me, the, the discipline of writing three pages a day as a writer. That's going to get me to the to, to the end goal, right? I want to complete this book. I want it published this year. Well, if I'm not putting in that three pages a day, then then there's a problem. The problem with habit is typically you have to force yourself into the habit through discipline. It's not the case with negative habits. It, it seems like it's much easier to fall into negative habits, which provide instant gratification which is it's the it's a human thing right this is this is what humans do this is what kids do this is in the marshmallow test that we've talked about i think on several episodes we yeah. talked about when the you know the, in the marshmallow test for people who haven't heard us talk about that this is it's in the 70s i believe they, they did this marshmallow test so what they would do is they would take <clears throat> this control group of children and they would set them in a room and they would, they would put a marshmallow in front of each one of the kids. The, the adult would say, well, I'm gonna leave the room in 10 minutes, for, for 10 minutes. If you, you can eat this marshmallow, but if you don't eat this marshmallow, when I come back, you're getting two. So they would monitor these kids on camera when they left the room, and it, it, it's adorable when you see the kids reacting to this marshmallow, and they're sitting there, they're staring at the marshmallow, and. And uh, they're, they're doing, doing all these different things. Some kids can't take their eyes off it. There was only 10, roughly, it was between 10 and 15% of the kids that were able to not touch the marshmallow. That it, and those kids were rewarded. So the, the man who did the study, it, it was one of the control kids, was his daughter. And he would always ask his daughter, just out of curiosity, hey, how is such and such doing in school? All these kids went to the same school. And she, the kids who didn't touch the marshmallow and were rewarded with the second marshmallow, all of them were testing higher. They were better at homework. They were more popular in school, not because of the way they looked or anything like that, but just because they were better at being friends. And, and so he went on to do this lengthy study into their college years, and, and they were just more successful. The kids that that weren't able to, what it boils down to is our ability to delay gratification. So the kids that weren't able to delay gratification, they, they didn't do as well. And a lot of them wound up falling into addictive behavior patterns. So I, I thought that was really interesting because it, it would make sense then that you would fall into patterns easier where instant gratification is, is, is the dangling carrot. Can I go ahead and have a disagreement with you already? You can, yeah. <clears throat> so in, in your intro, you're talking about habits, and you said, I think the key phrase here is that good habits are hard to form, bad habits are easy to develop. And you said because, you know, that there's a sort of a reward. Well, anyway, addiction and habits are totally different things. And I think mm. one on one hand, if it has to do with your reward center, it's more of an addiction. Whereas if you just do it out of habit, and there's no reward to it, it's a bad habit. Well, I'm glad you bring is that up. smoking a habit to you? See, I think it starts as a habit, but it becomes an addiction. 
Because but, eventually your brain gets rewired to feel a reward when you have the cigarette. So they Whereas at first you're doing it because you're cool. You're cool. You're cool. And it looks cool. So addiction, they, you know. I'm going to chime in and I'm glad you brought that up. Medically speaking, okay. addiction is a disease, right? Um, now, let's say in my early drinking career, uh, was it I used alcohol to go to sleep? Had bad problem. Had a lot of social anxiety, anxious anxiety in general. Self medication. So I was using it as self medication. Right. Before I used it as social stuff. I was taking like a couple shots out of my dad's uh, Nikolai vodka, and I was in sixth, seventh grade. A couple shots would put me down. And, and I would do that, probably not every night, but at least four nights a week, uh, something like that. Now, to me, that's, an ha that's a habit. You know, is there substance abuse disorder in there? Probably some. Um, but then once I got to ninth grade and drinking was more of a recreational thing, um, you know, I think it goes into a whole level of physical dependency and all that other stuff. But like... I think our mind gets plugged into habitual living, like taking the same route to work every day, going to the four different places for lunch, you know, a week, you know, like you replay, you know, the same scenario because it worked before. Like, oh, I took this route to work. And, but I think with the way that life is, and it's so systematic because that's all that I think life really is, is a bunch of fucking systems. And to tell you the truth, I can't stand it. So I constantly do things to break habit, to break routine. Number one, just for my brain state alone, because it'll change my, my brain state just by doing that. It's just a different form of emotional regulation therapy by changing up where I'm going, what I'm doing making things unpredictable, switching up everything. And I think that's, for me, <clears throat> definition-wise, I think that's the biggest difference between a habit and addiction. A habit, you notice it, you know, like driving to work. You take the same one unconsciously every day, you go the same way to work. It's very easy to fix that. You just notice it, then you take a different way. Yeah. Wake up one day and you go, holy shit, I'm addicted to liquor. A little bit harder to change that. Well, You're there, going to be fighting that for a long time. There, it's going to take a lot of energy to fix that. And it's not only going to be an emotional decision or a choice. It's going to be a brain thing. You're going yeah. to go through pain. You're going to go through physical dependence, right? That's the difference to me between a habit and an addiction. Well, most you, ad, most yeah. addictions are process. Most addictions are out, process, right? No, all addictions are process. Starts out as a process now, or is a process. I can speak from my experience and because I've abused substances. Can I say that I'm chemically addicted to anything? No. And that was when I would sit and... So eat. you can be an occasional crack smoker? Well, I, I never smoked crack, but I've, I've done crystal meth out in L.A. and it was occasional. And it was just for... And we're not going to get into what those reasons were, but it was when in Rome, when I was with the famous people that were doing it... Because I've never seen a, a, a recreational crack smoker. But we're talking about something different. <laughs> now... I don't, I don't know that there is one either, but I've, I've met them in L.A., you know what I mean? I don't know what they do behind closed doors, but it didn't destroy them. But what I'm saying is, it, are there those that are chemically predisposed to a certain substance? Probably. I don't know what that is. So for me, anything that I've ever fallen into, it's been a behavioral pattern. And yes, if you fall into a, a pattern that involves a chemical substance that is overpowering, that will take a significant amount of energy to break free from still a habit. You have to fall into it for it to be relevant. If you don't fall into it, it's not relevant. I think we have to also go into like the compulsiveness of the habit. You know, um, well, addiction is need. Habit is repetition. Yeah, you know, it was funny because there's like compulsive I'm gonna disorders. Break I'm going to break down the, what happened. You know, we were, we were talking about compulsive disorders like maybe like a year ago and the guy was like, well, how do you know it's a compulsive disorder? And one of the clinicians was like, well, if it's causing issues, you know, and he used the example like jerking off like six times a day. You know, if you're missing work or doing shit to 
go jerk off six times a day, that's an that's a compulsive obsessive disorder. And and that's gonna be an issue. Now is that habitual? It can be. Well um, it is, it's very much I have. You know, but to rewire that and it could be even also like some form of addiction too. You know, if it hits the pleasure pleasure center of the brain, which every single drug, alcohol, sex hits the hits that spot and dopamine's released. I like dopamine. Dopamine is good shit. The more I get of it, the better I feel. See, that's what I was going for at the beginning. Like an addiction is usually a reward thing where you get a reward, a dopamine hit for doing a certain action like smoking crack, like doing drugs or whatever it is. Whereas a habit, I have a habit of biting my nails. I don't get anything out of it. But you do. I don't. You, you do. You don't it's know. It's annoying. You it's disgusting. I don't like it, but I don't even notice I've done it until it's over with. So let me tell you what a habit is. And since the advent of <clears throat> MMRIs, this is fairly recent, 2008, when this, uh, I can't remember the, the psychiatrist's name, but she was able to finally get sensors onto a rat's brain, 150 of them, onto a little rat's brain. And they were able to, to run these tests on rats and able to watch the, uh, the pleasure center light up. So... A habit is comprised of three parts, comprised of a cue, comprised of routine, comprised of reward. That's what a habit is. Every habit has reward. It doesn't matter if you're, if you go into autopilot on your way to work and say, say you fall into traffic, you know you're going to hit traffic every day and there's those, those times where you just zone out. You don't even remember missing an exit, but eventually you get to work. Well, the reward is you get to work. It, but you zone out in the routine. So what they found on these rats is they would put them in the, the world's simplest maze, right? It's one direction to the chocolate. And at the beginning, the rats would, they would dick around, right? They would, and they thought the rats were really dumb. They would scratch the walls and, and you know, you're thinking as a human, well, the chocolate's right there. It's right there. And the rats would maul around. And then over the course of time, after they would, they would lift this wall and allow them this pathway, to the chocolate, they would find that the, the, the rats began to get more habitual and they would get to the chocolate faster. So based on that information, because at first you would see these spikes in activity in the rat and then eventually it would get to the chocolate and then you'd see the, the dopamine, the pleasure center light up. So as the rats got quicker at getting to the chocolate, you would think that, okay, well, you'd, you'd just see this constant spike, right? It would be level. What they found was, in the routine portion of the habit, all activity dropped. So there would be no brain activity. It, it was just basically non-existent because they fell into the routine. They got to the, the pleasure center quicker. And it's the same with any habit. Doesn't matter if it's biting your nails, doesn't matter what it is. If they put an fMRI on you, they would see that the, for some reason, there's some kind of innate subconscious pleasure something you develop maybe it's a oh it was a way to get out of some type of anxiety situation i don't know for you personally but there was some there there was some kind of defense mechanism there in the biting of the nails that leads to a dopamine spike now you don't know in the routine unless you're really paying attention what's what's generating this uh this fallout of brain behavior into this habit you know and for me it, it happens at night i'll watch it this is the worst thing i do now to this day <clears throat> is i, I for whatever reason, I if if I get bored and I'm not paying attention, I'm gonna walk to the fridge and I'm gonna look for some kind of bullshit food. Now, I may have fruit set out all over the place and whatever, and, and I may have worked, I work out five days a week, and I don't wanna have a gut, right? But there's something in me to where if I'm not paying attention, I'm going for that chocolate if I got it. Yeah. And I'll even and I'll even <clears throat> set up things, you know. Like, I'll, I'll have a Reese's cup up in the cabinet that I'm not looking at, but I know it's there. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll allow for the reward at the end of my, whatever you want to call it, my autopilot. But what they've figured out and what this, this book, The Power of Habit, talks about is, well, the way you break out of habit is not by, it's not by, uh, by having all of these consequences. You know that if you eat enough chocolate, you're probably going to gain some weight. Well, why don't you not have the chocolate in the house? Well, and and because that doesn't even work. So, so and what they and it's the same with an alcoholic not having alcohol in the house. You can have, you can still be a miserable motherfucker and pissed that you're not able to drink because you've prevented so yourself. Cookies was my go-to in the middle of the night for a long time, and 
still is. But I switch it up. So, like, I've been buying a little extra, like, this garlic hummus. You said the key thing. And the pita. So, 2 a.m. come around. Would I like to have cookies? Damn right. What am I going to have? Hummus and pita. You switched it up. And that's the key. Now, you take something, which... You always got to switch it up. You, you got to put... You have to put a reward there. That's what they've learned, is that you have to have some kind of reward. Because just saying the consequences are this, but, that's not enough. But, there's no reward really except me eating. But you're you're getting a reward. There's something there. It tastes good to me. And there's something and then eventually the the have it, it is a chemical too, because it will affect your brain, right? Yeah. Over time, it, eventually that will become habit. For me, it takes three days to fall into a habit. So if I fall out of the gym for three days, the fourth day I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna make an excuse not to go to the gym. Scientifically, it's twenty two days to begin a new habit. Sixty. I there's all kinds, always, there's all 20, kinds of different things. You're, you're going to find every 22 yeah, yeah, there's there's was what I heard the other night from some clinician. So if you want to start something mm-hmm. different, like a healthy habit, it takes 22 days. Before you start doing it I can tell you for me it's three. To get it locked in. It's three. If I can do something consistently for three days, it becomes second nature. Now that doesn't mean that I can't fall out of it, but I know for I know for a fact because I I, I watch myself daily, so that I don't fall into this pattern of post traumatic stress disorder. Working out, disorder. Working, out, working, out working out's a good one, but meditation too. Like if I fall off a of meditation for three days, I, I did it today, so I didn't work out all week, and then you know I'll, I'll I, I don't slack, but I can't go to the gym as much when I have the kids, so I didn't go Monday, didn't go Tuesday, didn't go Sunday. Today I woke up <clears> and. <throat> For whatever reason, I just didn't want to get out of bed. I was a little bit groggy, whatever, but I, I didn't want to get out of bed, and I found myself, I could always find something here, right, to distract myself. The second I made the decision to get out of bed, the second I stood up, all I had to do was stand up, and, you know, there was, it was get out of bed. It was There, there was just this, it, it, it became second nature for me to go throw my gym clothes on, and take my ass to the gym. There wasn't even a second thought you to said it at that point. You missed it for like five days? It was, it was like four days. Four days. So the four days that you missed, you went to work? I did other things with the kids. Or, yeah, things. yeah, with the guy. It, it was, you uh, didn't just drop them off and say, listen, I got to go to the gym right now. I just realized that I didn't do it. Everything is stopping. I'm not going to work. I'm not taking the kids out. I'm going to give up all my money to get a cab right now and go get some of that workout. No. That's not an addiction. That's a habit. Addiction is a habit, too. Addiction is a compulsion where it's, you absolutely have to meet it, and if you don't have it, you're going to go get it that moment. Right. I, we've all been addicted to things, right? I was addicted right. to I mean, would I say If I didn't have Vicodin for two days, habit, I was asking friends. I was habit becomes, trying to find money. For habit it. becomes addiction <clears throat> when the kind of... Because all addiction is is when you... It's, something, it's a behavior that you want to stop, that you know you should stop, but you can't. So when the consequences become great... To that extent, is that you can't stop it, then they'll label it addiction. But you don't just but it wake is a up habit. when you have an addiction. You don't just wake up and say, you know what, I just don't feel like doing some drugs No, you today. have to work to get out of that I habit. I just don't feel like it. I just don't have the Sorry, time. Sorry, guys. The, I'm just going to, you know. I'm just going to go on and live my life without it for, for a job days. Days. The point yeah. is, it's a habit. That's right? all That's it is, a, is a habit. It's I, a, and because just because the consequences are greater doesn't make it any less of a habit. I don't want to take up the whole con- uh, conversation. Because there's ritual, this, actually. I've been splitting hairs about the definition. I think the truth is addiction underneath is a habit more generally. Well, and but that's all habit, we do is play semantics. Habit is, yeah, semantics. I think that's all it'll to be. me, habit is not addiction. Addiction is not. Addiction is a type of habit. But I can't go the other way. Because they'll call it habit forming. Well, Some things are habit forming. Right. And, that, and, and it's what, what it is. What the fuck does that mean? And, and it once it becomes an addiction, the consequences are greater. 22 yeah. days. Right. At what point I'm, is an addiction? I might have a problem with it. Right. You know. And that's all the it, the whole point is in that which I found interesting with the, the rat uh, scans of the brain is that well we all know that there's a cue which we'll call a trigger right that's what it is it's a trigger you get the trigger then you fall into the routine and once you're heavily ingrained in the addiction well the routine is second nature now you know and not in order to break out of that second nature habit. You have to do something. It, for me, not doing shit, you know, not writing, it has become a habit. It's become a bad habit. Are there immediate consequences to it? 
How's the no. mastermind? The mastermind's good, but I still have to force myself because you're you haven't made it a habit yet. No, I, I there's other things. You know what I mean? There's right. other things that are which we could call addiction. And, I gotta get to my value. You, you know, know the value is always gonna be in there too. Well, I don't have to get to my. That's the thing. That's where I can look at this and say, well, this is kind of an addiction because the sitting and taking five, ten minutes, fifteen minutes in the morning to reflect and write in that book is so profoundly good for me. Yet I will make an excuse to go sit at my desk in my office of the company that I own, like I have to be there at a specific time. That's an addiction, right? That's some form of addiction. Now, it's not visible to anybody else, and you can argue that, well, it's your company. You should be there, right? There's a lot of things I can I can put up there, but it's still addiction in a way because what I'm doing is neglecting myself. And this, whatever this, I haven't figured out what that is and why I feel so compelled to be there. Um, and maybe it's just that I don't want to sit down and write about myself. It might be that, you know, there's, there's, but to your point, it's, it is a form of addiction because I'm engaging in a minor form of self-destruction. And I and see, I only say minor because it's minor to people outside of me because nobody else would ever notice it, but I notice it, you know, it, it, and when I don't sit down and write, I'm not going to sit down and write later that day. Where does discipline come in? Discipline is key. Discipline is key. And the interesting thing I found about, and what I did read in this book, and I, yeah, I watched some uh, some talks with the guys, some TED Talks who wrote the book. And the interesting thing is that if you want to form a new habit, you have to have a reward on the other end of that habit. There has to be a reward. If there's not a reward, and Robert Downey Jr. said this, and that quote lived with me, and it still does. He said, doesn't matter what consequences you put in front of an addict. It does not matter. There's no amount of consequences that's going to change their behavior for the long haul. They might do it temporarily to get out of jail or whatever, but you need a reason to live. If you don't have a reason to live, you can easily go and be a dry drunk, right? You can you can be a I, I, go into the program. You see people that are fucking miserable. They haven't touched alcohol or drugs in 20 years. They're fucking miserable. They're not happy. They're bitching all the time. You know what I mean? So if you don't have a reason to live, like something, a reward of sorts, it's not going to stick with you because it's not truly a habit. You know, and habit in, in the definition that was put on our, our page, that's the definition of habit. It's something that becomes second nature to you. You know, that reminds me of that, that book that was really big in the 80s or 90s. Uh, seven habits of very highly effective people. The highly effective Love people, it. yeah. Coven. Stephen Stephen Covey. That's the guy. The picture that we got on our page. That's him, Stephen Covey. So, yeah, I don't remember much about it, but I do know that it was goal based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before you set out to make a positive habit or a successful habit, you have to like kind of analyze where you're going with this. Begin thing. with the end in mind, he says. Exactly. That's something. Begin yeah, with I've the end able, in mind. Yeah. Begin, begin with the goal and work back from it, and then you know, obviously, there's. Some other basic, uh, obviously there's seven of them. Right. That, that, that was that, that's an extremely. You've read it, right? I um, browsed it. I read it when I was a kid. It's an extremely powerful book. It it it, it really is, and it's where I learned of the concept of interdependence, where we are. You don't want to be codependent, but you want to recognize value in your relationships with other human beings who don't drag you down, right? People that don't drag you down, who are also independent, but recognize the value in others, that's where you form strong interdependence. Oh, that's what, yeah, he, he breaks it into independence, interdependence, and continual improvement, which is be proactive, begin with the end in mind, first things first, mm -hmm. think win-win, seek first to understand, then to be understood, synergize, and then sharpen the saw. Yeah. And grow. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's the man. Stephen Covey's the man. 1989. That's, I remember it being sooner than it really was that long ago. See, and those those concepts will stand the test of time. This was prior to them figuring, being able to look into your actual brain and see how it lights up when you engage in, in a, a, a behavior that's been formed. It'd be interesting to see how your brain lights up to get you on an fMRI and catch you in, in the act of biting your fingernails and I'm see sure how they've they, done it. Well, I'm sure they have too. I mean, there, there's, but it'd be interesting, right, to, to see that there's there is dopamine that's getting released somehow is it dopamine i i know i say that a lot is it I serotonin no serotonin helps you go to sleep 
Dopamine is the addictive, addictive yeah. reward thing, but it's not the happiness. Well, dopamine and serotonin are both part of the pleasure thing. They're chemicals. They're, They're both part of it. Yeah. yeah. But the dopamine, the, 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 the dopamine is the... Yeah, that's the... In, that's, that's what keeps that's you coming back. That's, yeah. that's like the insulin spike when you get the sugar. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's the dopamine. That, that, that strong release of dopamine, that's what keeps you coming back. And look, when we talk about these habits, when we talk about mm-hmm. a chemical that is going to release dopamine to that... To that extent, all it's doing is releasing more dopamine. It's a chemical, so it affects you in an immediate fashion. That's all it does. It, there's no magic to it. No, it's none. A, what's it's a snowball? It's, I mean, it's yeah. That's the it. Same thing as roller coasters. I mean, roller coasters are like the dark yeah, they do. Casinos, casinos, casinos. Casino? Gambling, it. gambling right. is huge. I really don't like Las Vegas. I've been there a handful of times. I had to go there for work alone once. That's a that's different having to go along. So a lot of times in like certain things, like ritual comes into play uh, along with these habits, like going to a casino, going by your favorite machine, doing all that stuff. You know, some people have um, patterns that they do when they go. That's interesting. Same right with smoking crack. Yeah. You know. Going yeah, to buy, you know, the yeah. stem and the shit and then to the dope house. Like, if you talk to someone in recovery about, like, their use, and it was very systematic. You know, there was definitely ritual involved. And it was definitely, like, you know, it was just, like, the idea of going and buying dope and shooting up there was a whole ritualistic thing about it which made it you know that's the whole habit you know and that's that's true because I, I would talk when I was in a when I was in treatment I, I would talk to people that were addicted to heroin and it was crazy to me <clears throat> that they would form this weird relationship with the needle and I heard stories about people shooting up water and, and it, nothing that was going to get them high, but there was this 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 needle addiction, and that was uh, an addiction to the ritual. That's you know, just like they, smoking and the yeah, the right to the face thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. Chewing your nails, like doing gum, like doing candy. Or people that'll walk around. I knew I knew this guy. He he. Uh, I think you know him, but uh, we used to call him Uncle Carl. He lived down the street. And, I remember uh, Carl. Remember Carl yeah. and Brad and I did so uh, Elvis. Yeah, yeah. So he, his entire life, he couldn't drink because he was literally gonna die. He fucked it up way, way back. Then. Yeah. So, so he would walk around. He had, he would have cases and cases of non-alcoholic beer. The ritual of having this beer, and I'm sure there was something with the taste of it. I think it tastes disgusting, right? I, I, I never saw what the value was in beer, other than it, it could get you drunk, and it was a social thing. So I couldn't, I could never comprehend wanting to walk around with a case of something that wasn't going to have that effect and drinking it. But he did. He never went anywhere without his cases of non-alcoholic beer. It's ritual. There were, there was some, there was a, a pleasure that maybe he didn't even <clears throat> possibly understand. I definitely couldn't understand it as an outsider, but it, it was habit. It was habit. It was ritual. And rituals can be habit for me. You know, for me... I think there's a different end game with, with rituals than habits. Like, habits are things that you do over and over, and they become second nature. Right. right. I think ritual, what, when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about baseball first. Because, you know, pitchers have their ritual. Every time before they throw, they, you know, do this twice. What I, yeah, whatever this it is. Once. Yeah. And it's because at one point in time, they had a better game doing that. And they remembered all those things. And now they have to do those th- same things over and over to make sure that they keep having good games. And I think with the drugs and the beer and stuff, is you go through the ritual because you remember, okay, I'm having a good time, but I remember when I had a better time doing this one thing, this certain way, having that beer, I had the best time of my life. So if I just recreate that over and over, maybe I'll keep having a better time the next time. Well, it's also a lead into the habit. It's really what it yeah. is. Or if you practice a ritual long enough, it can lead you to the habit. For me, when I... There's a certain way in the morning I want to face east. When I, when I, it's ridiculous because if you think you go into space, there's no up, down, east, west, right? The Even Muslims though, took care of that actually. Because, what, what's that? Uh, the Muslims had to take care of that. The, 
they were going to have Muslim uh, astronauts. And they said, well, what do we do? Because there's no West in space. And it, it is officially now, you just do your best to aim towards Mecca. Right. So the, the idea is, you know, the sun rises in the east, the energy flows through, right? That's, right. that's the basic guy. But there is no direction. In space. And the sun doesn't actually rise anywhere. We're right, turning. <laughs> right, right. So, but that, but that was the idea, right? It was the, it was a human idea. Right. So, but I, I still like to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it feels made, good. Yeah, and I, I like to get that pillow out, and I like to sit on that pillow, and I, I do notice that sometimes I can use not having that, like if I'm on vacation with the kids, and I don't have access to that pillow or, or the ability to face east without having to go out to the hall of the hotel or something like that. I'll use it as an excuse not to meditate. So that's that's an instance where I can look at a ritual and say, well, the ritual kind of guides me to this habit that's healthy for me. Or maybe I need the ritual because that's not yet a habit. So it helps to trigger something. It, it helps to trigger the reward. That's a reward, kind of. I get to sit in the direction I want to sit in on the pillow that I want to sit on. And it's rewarding because I don't, I don't know why. I would, I would have to unpack that. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know why, but I think... I think in the same way you talk about, you know, the crackhead that has a stem and they want to go get you. Yeah. There, there's some there's some kind of weird reward in that. I don't know what that is. I've I've wondered about this many many times. What we what you brought up at the very beginning actually. Why it's so easy. Why it's so hard to do something good like form a good habit where every day I get up and I I brush my teeth and I sit down and I write for a half hour and then I meditate for a half hour. Then I go to the gym for a half hour or an hour. Why can't I do that every day? Whereas if I pick up a cigarette right in? now, I'm just going to smoke cigarettes you want to sleep all in? day. Right, all day. It's just going to be like It's that. so easy. It's so easy to just smoke instead. Yeah. So the thing is, a lot of times you have to find what your body enjoys. Yeah, my I don't body like, really wants cigarettes. I don't like working out in the morning. Rarely do. You know, like people who work out at 6 a.m., God bless them. That ain't me. That's me. That ain't I got, me. I got to do it in the I morning. Can't I can't do it. Can't do it's it. not, it's not, uh, I don't lift well. It's not my power time. Um, and I mean, I will lift at like nine or 10. Like if one of my boys is like. At night? You no, know, in the morning to meet I'm me sorry, at I'm the gym. By six. But tell you the truth, my power time is from 2 p.m. to around 7 p.m. Like I get to the gym in the, that frame time. I have no problem. You know, I'll work out a couple hours, I'll run, I'll lift, doesn't matter. Just because I'm stronger at that time, you know, and I've had a meal, maybe two, you know, things are different, not to mention I'm probably out of work or, you know, I'm, I'm on a break from work before I got to go back. You know, it's just different. Mm-hmm. It's just different. Um, I'm definitely not a morning person. I'm, I'm not either, you know, and it's. Then he's looking around like, how? I love being. You know, some people are. I, some people weird. are. I, if I don't, I just know that if I don't crack it in the head, more in the morning, I know that because I'm. I guess my it, it all depends on our daily lives and how they're structured, and or how the lack thereof of structure. And I know that me, I, I need structure. I still need structure. I'm, I'm like a kid in that way, because I've gotten away with so much in my well, life. Well, I say eighty percent of the business deals are done before noon. Well, so successful business people, tell you the truth, all the ones that I know, they're up at 4.30. That's weird because I, I'm you know? usually up at about 4.30, 5 o'clock, and then I'm, you know, I'm, this is a habit for me. I'll go to the phone and I'll look for something inspirational, something, and I won't move, and really, I won't get out of bed unless it's to use the bathroom until I find something that makes me, that puts me into a, a meditative state. When I'm really on my game, I'm going to get up from that state. I'm going to go down to my little meditation spot. I'm going to face east, and I'm going to meditate for 10, 15 minutes. Then I'm going to come up. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to throw on my, my gym clothes, and I'm going to go down. I'm going to grab a piece of fruit, and I'm going to hit the gym. And on my best days, I'm out, I'm out of the gym by 7 in the morning. You know, all that stuff is done on my best days. On my worst days, I don't leave for no reason. You know, I, it, like today could have been one of those days. I just did not want to get out of bed. And what I know for a fact about me is that all I have to do is stand up. Once I stand up, any grogginess that I feel, it's gone. Like, it's... So I I, I guess there there is a resistance in me in doing what's good for me. Like you said, you you know those things that are going to make your day better. You know what's going to make your day better. 
We have a, a I think it's a built-in resistance. I don't know that it's built in, it's learned over time. I don't know what that is. But I know that the antithesis to you're gonna so you're habitual whether you like it or not. That's We're the creatures thing. of habit. No matter what, you're gonna be habitual. And because it's easier to fall into bad habits, because I think the instant gratification has been programmed from a very young age, like the, the means to get that that dopamine spike or whatever it is through chewing your nails or whatever, whatever it is that you get, because you get something, you consciously don't like it. I consciously can't stand when I don't get my ass out of bed when I know that I should. And now... How long have you been doing it? Bite my nails? Probably since I was a kid. Yeah, my whole life. Yeah. That I can remember. And don't want to, but I, you know, Twain will catch me, and she'll be like, honey, quit that. I'm like, oh. I didn't, I didn't even know I was doing it. I was just sitting there, I was in another world, watching TV show or something, and here I am, like, mm-hmm. disgusting. Hate it. Why don't you grow them out? I tried. I've tried. Grow them out. It's just so easy. So easy to just change things like that. But see, that it's become like a, what you said, or like a compulsion. Yeah. See, that's an interesting one because you don't even know you're about to do it. It's so right. second nature and it's part of you. Right. So there's nothing to prevent you from doing it in autopilot. It'd yeah. be interesting to, to try to track that behavior. You know, because that's what I do now. I'll look at, I'll look at, there's some times where I don't want to brush my teeth um, at the end of the night. It's rare that that happens now, but in my bed, it's far more comfortable than my couch. My couch is comfortable too, but. There, there's a weird thing that happens in me to where it's it's a form of self abuse, right? I don't want to, I don't want to do this thing that it's just I, you do it, you know. It takes two minutes, and your breath don't stink, and you you know there's all these and and you keep the bacteria out of your mouth, and the bed's more comfortable, and I'm not gonna wake up with a cramped neck, and but for some reason, this little devil on my shoulder, whatever that is, wants to do everything in opposition to what's good for me. And when it's the little nuanced behaviors like brushing your teeth or going and sleeping in your bed or making the bed in the morning, have you ever read that or you, you know yeah, the concept, I mean, right? I, I do. I, I make my bed oh, before I. Hop that's in the bed. powerful. Like that. That's powerful. The first accomplishment to. of the day. Like get I, up and make the bed. I don't know. No, I do both. I, I, I'm, I'm, like when I wake up. First thing I do is go to the bathroom, and actually, first thing I do is pray right when I get up. That's powerful. Then, like, then I'll go hit the book. Then I'll go hit the mastermind stuff. And then I'll kind of, like, get dressed and everything and just put things together for my day, depending on the day. And I try to get out of the house relatively quickly and and go to work, you know. And that's just the way it is. I don't... My first 15 minutes are, like, first time I open my eyes, it's usually before light. And my first thought is like, fuck, not even light out yet. I could probably get like, uh, I'll grab my book. Yeah. I, I could get like another half hour sleep. Never happens. I could do another half hour sleep. Do that weird, wakey, sleepy, horrible thing. Right. I've done that for years and it doesn't help and it's awful. Yeah. But the last thing that I do be- before I get out of bed is say, I'm going to get out of bed. I'm starting at 10. Once I hit one, I'm getting out of bed. And I've never lied to myself. Once I hit zero, I'm out of bed, whether I want to be or not been experiencing like a lot of I've always had since I got sober I've always had some form of sleep issue um it comes and goes one of the times right now is that it's rough and I don't think I've had like a deep sleep in like a couple months you know yeah it's tough that'll, that'll throw you and, into some <clears throat> fucked up habits quick yeah I sleep really quick now for years because I've taken this blood pressure medication that makes me piss every three hours. Yeah. So I haven't slept more than three hours in a decade. So when I hit, it's maybe 10 to 15 minutes before I'm in the room. That's nice. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, weird. That's not weird. I mean, I, Einstein, that, that's, Einstein never slept full nights. Einstein, was it Einstein or was it Newton? I think it was Einstein that would, uh, that would just work and work and work. But and then two, two would, hour would, naps, that was he would catch. He would catch this, but I think it was Einstein who would put the spoon in his hand. and I, So he would hold the spoon, and he would fall into REM sleep. And then eventually, you know, you'd fall into full REM. And, and there's, there's some, there's some be- definitely neurological benefit to this. 
when you fall into REM sleep and you come right out of it, all you need is the REM. You just need to hit the state of REM. And then he would drop the spoon, the spoon would hit the ground, it would jostle him out, and then he's off to the races. And that's, that's how he slept. And I don't know how he slept at night or whatever. This is just what, what I've read and who knows, right? But um, Did you read about why you do REM sleep and why you need to sleep as a human being? They There's have, so many different studies, but yeah. I've, the I've, newest one last three years or whatever, they they figured out that it's a chemical buildup throughout the day, some sort of plaque way back here. That makes sense. And when you sleep, your brain dissipates that. If you don't sleep, it keeps building up, keeps building up until well, you can break. But it's some sort of buildup plaque during, during your awakefulness. And your REM sleep is what dissipates it. That's the latest one that I've heard, and there was and that, quite a bit of research. Well, that would make sense, because the dream state, right? The dream state is the breakup of that plaque. That's why it's so random. I, yeah, I could follow that. That, that. that would make absolute sense. I haven't read that study. But it, it, that's, that's interesting, though, because if I don't hit REM sleep, there are those nights, it's rare, that where I go through the, yeah, I don't sleep, and it's... I'll sleep, but it's broken sleep, and I never really hit REM. That's how you are when you're drinking, right? You're just going out, you get drunk, you have a hang. The, the hangover that you had the next day is as a result of that inability to hit REM. Because I don't think, you know, when I was out partying back in the younger days, that was never good sleep. Never. It was never good sleep. No. No, I slept. Because you still don't mind passing out, yeah. you know. But, yeah, I, but you always woke up feeling like shit. Oh, you? Of course yeah. you did, yeah. but like yeah. you know, unless you, unless you ate real good, you got you, you got wasted. Real good, mean and greasy shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. White Castle or yeah. some Denny's. You used to so do that's Hardee's. Hardee's. <laughs> National Institute of Health dot gov. That greasy shit was so good. It was so bad. Crystal Burger, man. Oh. Sleep helps restore the brain by flushing out toxins that build up during waking hours. That's the results, and they've been Can testing it for quite a while. On our yeah. page. Also helps with Alzheimer's plaques, they're finding out. So sleep. That's REM. Just REM. REM. Yeah, yeah, just REM. Hitting the state of REM. It's really you don't need to stay to there for any extended period of time. And so that's that's interesting that you can go back to REM. Because people are lucky to get one state of REM through the night. Right? For me, if I once I'm up, I'm up. Yeah. If I'm up at 4 30, I'm not going back to sleep. I'm not even trying. I know it's not happening. And you and unless, you know, unless I have someone in the bed with me. And she makes me lazy, you know. Then, then okay, then maybe. You it's know? her fault. But it's crazy. <laughs> but it's, yeah, yeah. but I like. But I like that. Like you know, because me on am left to my own devices. Once I'm out of REM, I think that's interesting because I do think I feel like I've released so much, and that's why I think I'm a morning person is because I do hit a deep state of REM. I only need three four hours. Like my max throughout the night is five. Yeah. I don't think I ever get more than six. When the kids are there, I'm, I'm on go until about midnight. Sometimes I'll go to bed at 10. It just depends on what the day was like, but I'm up at 4.35, like clockwork. The only time I'm not is if I'm falling into self-destructive patterns, meaning simple things like not meditating, I'm not writing, I'm not doing the things that I know are most beneficial to me. You know, that, that's, when, that's when things change. And because I can like, recognize those. Do you feel like it's because you don't have like that contentment that doing those things that are good for you? Yeah. Like if you're not content, if you if you feel like you're lacking something, it's hard as fuck to sleep. Well, I think I have this natural. It's not natural. It was built. There's there's something in me that wants to self destruct. So when I'm not doing major things like drinking or doing drugs or chasing meaningless relationships with women or. When I'm not doing stupid shit like that, that's on the surface, like you talked about, the things, the, the, the things that we call addiction, that we've labeled addiction, these habitual patterns that have gotten out of hand and now they're visible, right? When I'm not doing those things, my ego will try to find little small nuanced things like not brushing my teeth, like not going to bed, things that there's no immediate consequence to that on the surface. If I miss meditation that day, I'm not gonna die. And if I miss it, the next day and the next day, I'm not going to notice that, really, unless I'm paying attention. When when those minor patterns of self-destruction, I call them for me because I know where I wind up if I don't engage in these practices, where I wind up is not good. So my entire existence now 
from the moment I get up and I, I start to engage in these habitual patterns that are good for me is to not fall back into the old patterns. And the only way I can do that is by looking at the nuances throughout my day because it doesn't manifest itself in a major way anymore. It's been a long time since I've had the last PTSD bender I had was the drunk when I got that drunk driving two years ago. You know, that was the last one. And then prior to that, it was like once a year, you know, and, and then even the intensity, frequency, duration of these things had gone down through therapy and through other things that I was doing. So now I got to be extra careful in paying attention to my habits throughout the day. What, what type of patterns am I falling into? What type of rituals even you, you could call it? Because if I, if I choose to come in and there's nothing wrong with watching TV and unwinding that way, that way. But, I, but I do know there's a fine line between escapism and be, between me doing something that, that is enjoyable. Because if I got friends on, which I don't even watch anymore, but if I just got some dumb shit no offense to friends, but if I just got some rerun shit in the back of my, you know, just going on the TV for no fucking reason, and I got the mastermind journal over there, and I got my computer up there, and I'm done with the long hand of the book, and my goal is to put that thing out by the end of the year, and I'm sitting there scrolling through this while friends is playing in the background, that's a fucking problem, you know? And to me, it's just as detrimental as I might as well be out there getting fucked up on drugs. Well, Terrence McKenna always believed that uh, television was the most addictive drug there is. I, I, I can agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can it, agree. It's with like that. it massages your brain. Yeah. And just hours can go by, and you're like, wait, no. what the fuck? You know, I had all to... kinds of things I was going to do. Yeah. My, my, like, God damn it, Ross. Yeah, exactly. Or what? <laughs> what, what is it? Like, impractical jokers. Yeah. Just, it, it's fucking funny. You know, but I've seen every one of them. You know, the kids loved it. They turned. I didn't even know what it was, but yeah, change it up. I'll catch myself with that. Just playing. It used to be Family Guy. Mm -hmm. A new love connection. Don't tell me that. (laughs) Love connection. Be back in two and two. As you were talking, that the the thing that popped in my head was, it seems to me that you have to, as a person, as a functioning person in society and everything, you have to put a lot of will and effort into keeping things together. Keeping things rolling forward, keeping an order to yourself and to your life. Because if you just sit around and let things happen, it will descend into chaos. Well, Russell Brand, and, and this is was, the, the waterfall. I was sort of bringing it. Yeah, go ahead. But is that what you were going Like, there, there's this force, you know, that Russell chaos Brand said this. Entropy, I was going to go for it, but yeah. Well, we, we got to have a conference. We should do an episode on entropy because I met this quantum physicist out in. Uh, out, out at the Conference for Consciousness and Human Evolution in London. Her book's amazing on, on entropy. And really, entropy is a accumulation of information, even though we view it as human beings, as a degradation, as a, a fall into chaos. It's not. You've acquired more information. You take on a new state. But you're taking more information. I got I to gotta get that book to you. It's fucking amazing. Like, the, when she said that, she said, I, I view the big, not as the big bang, but the big breath. Oh shit! Uh, uh, that that threw me, and now now I'm thinking about that instead of what the hell were we talking about when you brought that up? Because we should have an episode on entropy. Absolutely. So what I was bringing up is basically it takes willpower to overpower willpower. the entropy of the universe. Right? Things want to fall apart. There's books and books written about things falling apart. So what what uh, waterfall you're gonna bring? Up. Yeah, Russ, Russell Brand said the spiritual life is like you're in a rowboat and you're rowing away from a waterfall. You can do it, but it, can, it takes constant effort, right? Now, if you, you may need to take, take the paddle out, take a break. If you're not aware of that force, because you may be far away, but the force is still eminent, right? It's still pulling back at you. And that's not flow for some reason. You know what I mean? It's, it, 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 there's, when we talk about flow, it's so easy to misconstrue being pulled into these faulty patterns, these negative patterns as flow, but it's not something different. So when he said that, that just resonated so powerfully with me because it's like, okay, well, you got to put in constant effort because there is a force of the universe that's going to pull you back into old ways. What is that? It's our subconscious programming. It's the shit we had. No, we didn't create this, you know, and there's different studies that'll say, well, your personality is formed by three, your personality is formed by seven. Somebody will say five. But the one that I found that really resonated the most was third trimester till three years old, your personality is formed, give or take a year and, you know, whatever. But your personality is formed. 
auto programmed like a computer, your operating system has been put into place. So, so in that regard, it's not flow. When, when, you, when you lift the paddle out, when you stop the effort into the spiritual existence, because in our dualism, from the time that we're born, as spiritual beings having a human experience, or let's just say quantum systems in this human experience, right? Now confined to the five senses, but quantum systems. So even from a scientific perspective, we're something different than what this is, right? Our true nature is something completely different. E equals MC squared, we're, we're energy, we're frequency. That's what we truly are. And then this has been manifest. Some would say through consciousness, whatever. <clears throat> but we're constantly working against that if we're lucky enough to know we need to, you know? And that's, that's, that's the thing is that it, it, we're always working against shitty patterns. That's also the burden of being a human, right? Like there's no other animal that does that. No. Or has to worry about no. it. No. Like a raven doesn't care if it does bad things. Or if it dies. Or it's not it even does, thinking about not, it. It doesn't it's even know that it's me. going to die one day. Yeah, it's not a it thing. It has no idea. Yeah, it just does eventually. <clears throat> I was reading an interesting book called uh, Thoughts on Existence or whatever. I don't, I don't remember who it's by right now. But uh, one of the very first things he says is, this is a philosophical book and I want to talk about the definition of philosophy. And he says, you know, people sit around and say philosophy is this. It's, you know, being able to reason being able to talk and argue, it's being, it's looking for meaning, right? He says simply, you know, if you if you read enough philosophy, all philosophy is concerned with the meaning of death. Because that is the question everybody's afraid to talk about. Some are, most are. It's the thing you don't want to think about. It's the thing that you don't want to go through, unless you're, you know, spiritually inclined mm -hmm. and you're not worried about it. <clears throat> but that, that really got me thinking, you know, is death, sort of like this entropic thing? Is it things falling apart, or is it things actually following the the pattern? The true nature? The true nature. The true See, I, you, know, you would say is it... I'd like to get back to that, like, maybe next show? You, I, well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to come up with a nice write-up for that, for that <clears throat> to try, try to break down. I'd like to people. talk about entropy and death specifically. Yeah, I'm, I'm game for that. Drop comments or send messages if, yeah. if you got it, but I, I like that. Because that, that's something we could talk for 10 episodes or forever on. Because it's true, like, we're the only species that has the ability to contemplate our own demise. Mm -hmm. And that's scary shit. It's not for me. It's self-will. We're the only things that have self-will. A yeah. dog doesn't have self-will. No, A dog just not. has God's will. But I thought I'd mention it because we're talking about habits, right? Yeah. And I think one of the underlying reasons that we have a lot of habits addictions whatever it is is because we're afraid of death like you you have a habit of going a certain way to get home because you know that it's safe I'm because always, you're afraid to die i think it's a normal thing to uh, for most people to avoid things that are going to jeopardize my life and on the other hand you can get addicted to things that absolutely will kill you yeah. eventually but yeah. you're going to do it anyway and going back to my original thing, that's what I think the difference is between habits and addictions. <laughs> I mean, and I brought again, it all the way first, full circle. And again, it's it's semantics because all an addiction is is a, a habit that's gotten out of control, and there's dire consequences. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, right. you know. At, at the end of the day, but yeah. So anyway, we were getting the two minute warning mark, <laughs> but that, it's true though. It, that, that's Absolutely. why we do this shit so we can. There's other people thinking that, right? So if we're sitting here and we're just talking one concept and we're not we're not throwing things out there to unpack the shit, well, what's the point of this? Like we could talk about what we agree on all day, and there's, there's that's no, not very interesting. No, there's no relevance to it. I mean, you know, we can. I just don't think there is. I think it's important to have other people. I, I have some great friends that are Trump supporters. I can't for the life of me wrap my brain around what that is for some of them, but there's some that I do. I'm like, I get it. I, I see why, but it's because I seek to. In the same way I seek to break these negative behavior patterns. At the end of the day, we're all humans. And at the end we're of the day, right? no matter who you vote for, we're still going to be living next to each other and doing things for each other. So you, you, when it comes to political stuff and political divide, don't hate people or because even this, of what they believe. Even this, you know, because we can disagree on the, you know, we can fall into semantics and disagree and get stuck in the fucking semantics. Yeah. And then the whole episode winds up being we're, we're all we're doing is we have def different definitions of this thing, and now nobody benefits, right? You know. So anyway, open mindedness, uh, you know, is always crucial for human existence. You know, 
like happy that, human existence. That's human why existence there's so much suffering. division is because like Trump supporters or however it is going on in the country, uh, you know, there's just been like a lot of fear based tactics which people get aroused by because it plays on the dopamine. fear strings. Well the dopamine too. And then next thing you know And tribalism. And you got you know, you're feeling some shit and now you got, you know, where's mine? All the entitlements, people are very entitled. And so, like, if you fuck with my entitlement, you know, you got to go. There's not enough for all of us. Well, and that whole it. lack and limitation thing is alive and well in America. That's how they, that's how most Americans live. By what am I not getting and how much do I not have? Or I'm going to spend the money that I really shouldn't afford. You know, I'm going to go get a new iPhone even though I ain't got no food in the fridge hmm. and my credit card is about to be maxed out, but I'm going to get that. I'm, I'm going to get that. I, get your, I got a habit, you know. Are we at the end of... All right, you got to wrap it up. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good, too. Have good habits. Uh, make a habit out of sending us more messages and uh, keeping us on, on track with, with the subject matter, what you want to hear, what you want to discuss. Give me condition, we're all. Yeah. You're all set.